Good afternoon. Last year, a number of cross-government initiatives were launched to ensure that Afghans arriving in the UK receive the support they need to pursue education and integrate into their local communities. In addition to the thousands of Afghans who have worked with the UK government and their families who have already been resettled in the UK through the Afghan Relocations and Assistance Policy, the government has committed to welcome up to 20,000 vulnerable refugees from Afghanistan over the coming years through the Afghanistan Citizens Resettlement Scheme. At least £12 million have been made available to prioritise additional school places so children can be enrolled as soon as possible and to provide language support. As more Afghan families are moved out of temporary accommodation as we speak and into longer term housing, schools continue to welcome new arrivals. Today, we have a panel of three experts in refugee education who will give us useful information and practical guidance to help ensure a smooth induction period for learners and their families. Before I introduce our speakers, I just wanted to briefly explain the structure of this webinar. Each of the three speakers will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. After they finish their presentations, there will be time to ask any questions that you may have. Please feel free to use the question and answer box to send any questions to the presenters as they come to you, i.e. you don't need to wait until the end, and I will collect them and post them to Catherine, Jane and Megan at the end. Tomorrow you will receive an email from us with a link to access the video recording of this webinar. Enough of me now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speakers in the order in which they will speak. So first of all, we will be listening to Catherine Gladwell, Founder and Chief Executive of Refugee Education UK, a charity which helps refugee and asylum seeking children and young people get into and thrive in education from primary school to university. She's also the founding director and board member at Jigsaw Consult, a social enterprise building evidence on education, forced migration and technology through research. Catherine has led large scale multinational practical interventions and research programs and worked in 16 countries. Before working for Refugee Education UK and Jigsaw Consult, Catherine worked in education in emergencies that saved the children UK and as a teacher. She has a degree from Oxford University and a master's in education from University College London and is an honorary fellow at Winchester University. Our second speaker will be Jane Daffay, independent, independent education consultant and the manager at NEST, Nottingham Education Sanctuary Team. Until 2018, Jane was the senior achievement consultant in Nottingham City Local Authority's ideal service, identity, diversity and DAL, providing training, advice and support to city schools. Her specialisms include black achievement, race and equalities, diversity in the curriculum, English as an additional language and refugee education. Our third, third and final speaker will be Megan Greenwood, School of Sanctuary Coordinator at City of Sanctuary UK, a charity which helps communities such as schools become welcoming and safe places for those seeking refuge from violence and persecution. Megan has previously worked in both the formal and informal education sectors in the UK and abroad. She has an Erasmus Mundus joint master degree in education policies for global development in which she focused on refugee and migrant education. So welcome warmly Catherine, Jane and Megan and over to you Catherine. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Silvana. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and I'm really looking forward to uh, your questions and comments and a bit of a time of being able to learn together. Uh, so um, I have the privilege of kicking us off today. Um, and what I'm going to do um, is just go through a few things that I think it's useful to understand about refugee children and families likely previous experiences of education before they get to the UK. Um, and then I'll just set the scene by looking at some of the most common educational challenges that refugee children face um, before Jane and Megan share some practical solutions. Um, so if I could get the next slide, please, Silvana. 
Thank you. Um, so thinking about refugee children's education before they arrive in the UK, um, this um, typically uh, will have taken place in one or more of three locations. So of course, um, their country of origin before whatever circumstance arose that led to them having to flee. Um, secondly, um, in a refugee camp. Uh, so many children uh, that we work with have spent several years um, in the camp environment engaging with education in some form or another other there. Um, and then thirdly, on the move. Uh, so many have spent months traveling to the UK um, and have had various opportunities or lack of to engage with education there. Um, so next slide. Oh, you're there already. Thank you. Um, so what I, what I want to do kind of from that is just draw out key three features that are common to many refugee children's previous experiences of education. Um, and of course, we recognize that everyone's experience is unique. Um, what I'm trying to do today is just cluster together um, some of the key things that, that we think are important to keep in mind as we interact with and support these children as they adjust to the British education system. Um, so the first thing is disruption. Um, uh, children's education um, has almost always been disrupted in some way, shape or form pre-flight, um, whether that's because they're coming from a context um, where they've been affected by broad, um, low enrolment and completion rates in education um, across their country of origin, or if it's because there's been a specific impact um, on their ability to attend school um, by conflict. So disruption. Um, secondly, absence. Uh, we often find that children uh, will have had long periods out of education. Um, and this can have been because of school closures um, prior to fleeing, um, or it's simply just not being safe to attend school. Um, it can have been because of months in the move when their movements have been controlled by people smugglers. And even if they have spent a period of time in a context where education or informal education has been available, not being able to access that. Um, and thirdly, it can be as a result of the patchy education provision that is available in many camps where there are long waits um, to get places in provision, even when it is available. Um, and the last thing just to draw our attention to um, is that when education has been received, it will ordinarily have been quite informal for the years preceding their arrival in the UK. And this is particularly when young people have spent time in camps. Um, the average length of stay in a refugee camp now is 17 years. Um, so we're kind of a long way past this kind of idea that people just spend a few weeks or a few months in a camp and then move on. Um, we work with children who have been in refugee camps for years before finally um, arriving in the UK. Um, their education has been informal, sporadic um, and largely unaccredited um, in those provisions. Um, although at the same time, uh, if you're particularly interested in this, it is worth looking into more. There is a wealth of learning um, to be had from some of the quite innovative models of education um, that you find in emergency um, and initial displacement contexts. Um, but these are just kind of three sort of salient features of likely previous experiences of education that it's useful to be aware of as a backdrop. Um, but I'm going to move on now just to outline some of the key challenges um, that may affect refugee children's education here in the UK. Um, and that's informed both by the research um, and also through about kind of 10 years worth of casework notes um, from across our organisation. So we've divided these challenges into academic challenges and well-being challenges. But of course, uh, you know, these categories are interlinked and overlapping. And I think we all, we all know that our well-being affects our learning and vice versa. But I hope um, that you do find it nonetheless a useful way of clustering things with the brief time that we've got. Um, so um, in looking at the well-being challenges that these children face, we're going to look briefly at what has happened and is happening. So the common causes of poor emotional and psychosocial well-being in resettled refugee children, and then what you might see in the classroom as a result of this. So looking at the table on the left, uh, four key things that many refugee, refugee children are likely to have experienced. Um, of course, uh, really distressing or indeed traumatic experiences in country of origin. Um, and with a lot of children, and this is particularly the case with some of the Afghan children that we're working with more recently, um, these experiences have been going on for many years prior to fleeing. Uh, you then add to that experiences on arrival in the UK. So whether that's being confined to emergency hotel accommodation or having to navigate a hostile asylum system, this is often described as another additional layer um, of trauma that is added onto what has gone before. 
Um, and then added to that, of course, we have um, significant grief and anxiety and the loss that is being navigated as part of being a refugee um, compounded by isolation and loneliness um, in the UK. So what do you see um, as a result of that in your classroom? Uh, well, I'm sure I'm sure many of you have kind of heard about or um, or experienced or researched the kind of fight or flight mechanism, um, and so we know that when children have witnessed serious violence or experienced trauma, then the flight or fight re response in their brains is really easily reactivated, and by things that might seem to be relatively insignificant stressors. And um, so when this happens, the sympathetic nervous system acts like a gas pedal, and it kind of floods the body with adrenaline, raising the heart rate, switching the thinking part of the brain off and putting all of our physical senses or all of the child's physical senses on high alert. Um, and so when this happens, of course, you might see extreme behavior in the classroom, um, anger, hitting, pushing, um, complaints of physical pains um, in a child's body. Um, the flight part of this same mechanism can lead to distance, withdrawal and disconnection. Um, and so, you know, we often see children that don't want to interact with others at all um, and that can seem like the opposite and you know very different response but of course it actually comes from the very same um, hormonal response in the child um, to whatever the stimulus has been. Um, the well-being challenges that have been experienced, we also see them leading to reduced concentration and focus in the classroom. Um, so we find often children can be more easily startled, distracted or find certain noises or situations triggering. Uh, we also see tiredness and falling asleep. So one of the most common struggles that a lot of the children and young people that we work with battle with is insomnia. Um, and this inability to sleep well at night leaves them tired and sleepy during the school day. Um, and of course, we also see visible distress. Um, when something triggers a child, they do and can become visibly upset in the classroom or playground. Um, but I do just want to pause there and say that um, although um, you know I, I am talking about some of the common challenges today and these things are real um, uh, and we do need to talk about them, what we actually see as a result of many of these things that young people have experienced um, in the young people that we work with is a really remarkable resilience and um, determination and a sense of hope um, and I don't want that to be forgotten and um, you know I'm not talking about solutions um, and responses to these challenges today but if I were um, I would want to really emphasize um, an assets-based approach um, to working with young refugees. It's just what we try to integrate into all of the solutions that we um, try to bring. Um, okay, so uh, could I have the next slide please, Silvana? Thank you. Um, um, so we've talked about kind of trauma and psychosocial well-being under the well-being uh, category, but of just as we move into the more academic challenges, I do want us to remember that mental health challenges um, for refugee children, of course, impact every aspect of a child's ability to learn academically. Um, so uh, we're going to look at academic challenges that are uh, very visible in the classroom and challenges to learning outside of the classroom, which might be less visible. Um, so in the classroom, and perhaps the most obvious challenge faced by most refugee children um, is the language barrier. Um, and in many schools, and I'm sure you're more than familiar with this, um, insufficient EALs um, support to meet those needs. Um, I think we, we often find that in addition to that, um, and particularly in secondary schools, the structure of GCSE programmes um, and language acquisition alongside that in particular makes it hard for children to achieve their potential. Um, so I'm very glad that we're here um, with the Bell Foundation today. I can't think of any organisation better place to um, help us work through and navigate some of those EAR challenges and language barriers that children face. Um, in addition to that, um, styles of teaching in countries of origin are often very different to the UK. Um, and of course, if children are expending energy adjusting to and adapting to a whole new curriculum, a whole new teaching and learning style, um, then they have less energy left for the actual learning itself and might need support with that. Um, then lastly, and as with any population of children, um, a number of these children will have special educational needs and disabilities, but these can be much harder to both diagnose and to address in children who have English as an additional language and an existing trauma layer that we find um, in many of the children that we work with. 
Okay, now turning to the things that may affect academic outcomes outside of the classroom. Um, next slide, please, Silvana, thank you. Um, from the majority of children that we work with, there is at present nothing like an appropriate environment for home study. Um, so access to the internet and to computers is still very limited for many families. This is the case for um, a lot of Afghan families in bridging hotels at the moment. Um, there are a lot of disruptions. Um, and even when families move into permanent accommodation or are in asylum accommodation, um, they still often struggle with access to the internet and issues to do with overcrowding. Um, secondly, um, lack of parental support and engagement has come out as kind of second um, most frequently observed challenge. Um, and uh, it, this is likely not out of any kind of reluctance on the part of the parent or any kind of devaluing of education, um, but just um, a lack of engagement in their education and homework, et cetera, um, because of the own challenges that they are facing, um, including their own language barriers, having to look after other children, um, and of course their own adjustment and sense of dislocation. Um, and so in this context, we find that even things as simple or as seemingly simple, I should say, um, as reading a child's phonetics flashcards or reading book with them may, may well not be happening. Um, finally, the third and um, most frequently kind of observed challenge to education and to academic outcomes that we've observed is possible poverty. Um, in terms of a child's uh, education, it affects transportation to school, nutrition, the ability to buy uniforms and equipment, um, and as time goes on, participation in extracurricular activities. And of course, all of this kind of comes together to contribute to the overall learning experience and academic progress that children are able to make. Um, so, finally, this is a whistle-stop tour. We could have done a six-week course in depth on every aspect of this. Um, what does RE UK um, do in response to some of these things? Um, so next slide, please, Silvana. Um, like Silvana said, we exist to help children and young, and young people um, who are refugees to get into school and thrive in school, both academically and in terms of their well-being, and then progress through their education right up to university. Um, so we do this through a range of practical kind of in-person and online support programmes that work directly with about 700 young refugees each year. Um, we also do um, quite a lot of research and advocacy. Um, so our work generates a lot of data. Um, so we work with various university and UN partners um, to try really just to bring about some form of structural change in the long term in the hope that one day uh, we won't actually need to exist as an organization anymore. Um, and then finally, we do a range of training um, uh, and resource production for schools, further education colleges, universities um, and other education actors. So uh, whilst I'm not here to talk about solutions per se today, if you would like to follow up with any of our further training resources or practical programmes, then please do feel free to get in touch um, for you on the next slide, please, Silvana. Um, you can see there just some places that you can go to on our website um, and some of our basic contact details that you can use um, if you would like to reach out. Um, and a final slide, uh, you can of course find us or follow us on all of the normal places um, in social media. Um, and it uh, only remains for me just to say thank you so much for being interested and caring enough about this topic um, and outcomes for young refugees that you gave up your time to come today. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Jane um, and from Megan and hearing questions later. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Catherine. So we will now listen to Jane. Over to you, Jane. Hello everybody, my name is Jane Daffay and I'm from Nottingham, from, from NEST, as you can see the Nottingham Education Sanctuary team. Um, I'm hoping that what I say to you will very much chime with the, the messages that have come from Catherine, that was really useful, thank you Catherine. Um, so NEST is a bespoke provision, could you go back please, thank you Silvana, a bespoke provision for asylum seekers and refugees in Nottingham. As you can see from the image there, we work with older learners, our learners are all aged between 15 and 19. Um, from an, uh, I come very much from an inclusion background, as you will have heard in the introductions and the bio, um, but we uh, in Nottingham felt that we were in a position where we needed to provide uh, a really strong educational forum for our young people arriving in the city who were struggling to access education. 
lots of young, particularly unaccompanied young people who were out of education uh, and unemployed for, for long periods of time. And so we've had the luxury of being able to, to design a school, a mini school, um, with their needs in mind. I'm going to share with you some very practical solutions to this and, and I hope that even if you're working in a more mainstream environment you'll be able to steal some of those and transfer them to your own context. Thank you. So um, I noticed flashing up on the screen that we have uh, two delegates who are really important to, to this work at NEST. Joe McIntyre, welcome. I'm going to speak about Joe first. She was very instrumental in helping us to plan NEST uh, from the outset. Um, and you can see the book that was published there, the Refugee Education Book. Take a note of the image on the front cover because that's very important and think about the word NEST. Um, Joe's work along with certainly colleagues in Sweden who I believe are also here today has been really instrumental in helping us to design um, our curriculum and think about the, the ethos in particular that we wanted to create um, to meet the needs of this very particular group of young people. We work with asylum seekers and refugees um, across the board, those with families, uh, those who've been reunited, but also those that are unaccompanied. And we've obviously, like many of you, received a lot of Afghan young people um, since the summer. Um, a lot of Joe's work uh, initially was based on the findings of, of Rabbi Kohli. You can see um, the, the mention there, the link. Um, and he worked from a social care perspective and came up with this um, three-part um, three -part, part model of safety, belonging and success as the three strands that were key um, for, for this group of young people or children. And Joe has worked very closely with us to look at how that model can be transferred to an education perspective. So safety, belonging, success is going to be threaded through my talk today. I'm going to look at some concrete examples of how we use those three things and ways in which we, we meet those three um, aims uh, at NEST. Um, when we recruited our wonderful staff initially, our teaching staff, um, safety, belonging and success were caught the recruitment process to ensure the staff that were working with us um, shared our vision and understood the ethos and what we were trying to create as we designed our new curriculum. Thank you. So um, you can see the size of our school. In fact, this was written a week or so ago, and we now have 53 students at NEST. Um, 12 of whom are female, um, and we can add Albania to our list of countries of origin. So it's constantly changing. And this was one of the key challenges for Nottingham City, the fact that a lot of the children and young people and families will not arrive um, at a particular point in the year when uh, to, to match with the academic year. And therefore we needed a provision that was far more flexible than that. I would echo everything that Catherine said, but I would also want to add, as she did, that this cohort is extremely diverse. And we also have many students who come with a very strong academic background, who are very ambitious, um, already have a good level of English, um, and are feeling happy and settled in their new home. So very, very diverse in terms of the context of the young people we work with. Thank you. It's all in the name, NEST, the Nottingham Education Sanctuary Team. You can see our logo. And from, the, from day one, we share the image, the metaphor of a NEST with our students so that they understand immediately what it is that we're trying to create and hopefully instill. These images are used around the building. Uh, you can see that we have three tutor groups, the Ospreys, the Swallows and the Swifts, who were selected because they are migrating birds. 
So images and themes such as safety, protection, nurture, learning, teaching and learning, family, fragility, growth, and eventually flying the nest and hopefully, hopefully returning as visitors are all things that we work on constantly with our learners. Um, and they understand this image very well and often will refer to nest as their second home. Thank you. Safety, um, I'm going to look at first. I'm going to think of three examples of the way in which we ensure safety for our learners. Bearing in mind that some of our young people have been trafficked, safety has to be in the forefront of, of, of our thoughts. Um, so emotional well-being and mental health first. We have an in-house counsellor once a week. Um, it's called Space to Talk incredibly well used by our learners. There is no stigma attached to working with Beth. She's seen very much as part of the team, but having a different job and a different role to the teaching staff. And she does both one-to-one -one and group counselling um, and has a very strong link with our local CAMS service. Our PSE curriculum also focuses strongly on emotional well-being the students study that mo module early on and uh, it's part of what the qualifications that they take in PSE um, and also enrichment we ensure that our young people have an opportunity to take part in activities such as drama and music and sport and other things that we know will help help their mental health as well as their physical well-being Number two is breakfast. So feeding, we learned very early on that both food and faith are two very important things for asylum seekers and refugees. And we make sure that we meet the needs of both of those things. Breakfast is laid on each morning for our students, um, hot drinks, cold drinks, snacks, fruit to ensure that their basic physical needs are met. Some of our young people are living in very difficult co uh, conditions as, as Catherine talked about in terms of the poverty. Um, bus passes and other practical things, laptop donations that we've received. These are all ways in which we ensure the safety of our learners. And thirdly, people such as Joe, but other um, specialists in their field make up an advisory group which works a bit like a governing body for us and we ensure that we have people with a legal background, social care background, mental health, accommodation providers who are all key partners and, and are very much part of the wider team at NEST um, and support our teaching staff who can't possibly be experts in all of those fields to meet the needs of our learners. Thank you. Belonging, student voice and the ability for our young people to be able to give their opinions is very important. They're always involved in recruitment of teachers. Um, we have something called the Learner Journey, which is a portfolio that, that they build up during their time with us, in which they're able to, um, to evaluate the activities and the curriculum and, and give their opinions on, on preferred activities. We have an open door policy, um, so often they will come to me with little or bigger issues that they want me to explore and address, and we always do. Exit questionnaires are used with all our students at the end of the year at transition, so we, we get a feel for the things that have been most important for them. And we also treat them as the young adults that they are. And if we think that there's an important um, initiative or something happening politically that they need to know about, that is also discussed with our learners. Um, this is their new home and we want to create a sense of belonging to their new city. Um, and so we're often off site, um, taking part in um, activities, exploring the facilities that are available to them, such as galleries and museums, sporting uh, venues and so on, so that they start to feel that this is a, a new home for them. 
Global and anti-racist curriculum is known as GARP in Nottingham, which was something I was involved in many years ago. Um, we want to ensure that we build on the skills and experience that our learners bring. We always attempt to, um, to enter them for MFL GCSE exams where they exist. If we're studying a particular topic, then we will also look at that from the perspective of their home countries. So when we looked at World War II in humanities, we looked at the impact of World War II on each of their home countries, such as Sudan, for instance. Um, lots of opportunities for anti-racist teaching, show racism the red card, and again, our PSE module, and also regular celebration of the key festivals and important days for them. So last week was World Hijab Day, and we were able to introduce that, which was very empowering for our girls. Thank you. And finally, success. Um, we have um, character strengths that are threaded through our year. The character strengths that we focus on are kindness, teamwork, love of learning, perseverance, leadership, creativity, and bravery, all ways in which um, our young people can succeed other than in academic success. Um, and these are uh, valued, these are rewarded, they are spotted by teachers and regular certificates are given, which again build up for the students' learner journeys. Phonic books, um, we were made aware very early on that many of our learners uh, join us not only new to English, but also new to literacy, non-literate in first language, and that learning to read was a, a key skill that we needed to focus on. So reading is a big part of our curriculum. Every morning, there's a half an hour reading session. And we use the Phonic Books uh, website, which you can find where they have a series of titles, which are uh, graphic in a graphic novel format and very appealing for older learners, but it's a progressive phonics program. Our wider curriculum that I've mentioned is key for building on the, the strengths and the skills that our learners bring, whether it be embroidery, whether it be gardening, whether it's cookery, um, again, other ways in which our young people can succeed. But of course, um, they also succeed academically because of the nurturing environment, they thrive. Thank you. So the contact details for myself and the wider school that we're part of, HHE, the head teacher's name is there underneath mine and, and our uh, direct phone number and the website. Um, so please, please take a note of that and um, get in touch if you'd like to find out more about the work in Nottingham at Nest. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Janet, for your presentation. And now we will invite our third and last speaker to join us. So over to you, Megan. Hi, Solana. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really thrilled to be talking um, to you all today. And I really hope that I can kind of complement some of the things that Catherine and Jane have already mentioned um, and, and explain a little bit about what Schools of Sanctuary is all about. Um, so next slide, please. And you can pop onto the next one as well, please. <laughs> So basically today, what I was hoping to cover was um, give a bit of background to Schools of Sanctuary and how Schools of Sanctuary fit into the vision of the organization I work for. And then I was gonna focus in a little bit more on the Schools of Sanctuary model and process. So what it would look like for a school that was wanting to work towards recognition as a School of Sanctuary. And then finally, I was gonna focus in on one aspect of the Schools of Sanctuary model, which is learning about migration and why this is a really important feature um, or aspect of school practice for schools that are wanting to, to make their school a place of welcome. So a bit of background first. Um, so I actually work for City of Sanctuary UK, which is a small um, UK wide nonprofit organization working within a much broader national movement about welcome and belonging. And our vision is that all places in the UK should be places of welcome, belonging and safety for people seeking sanctuary in the UK. 
And so there's two main ways we do this. So one way is that we act as an umbrella organisation for over 120 local groups across the UK, providing them with support and coordination. And these are very much people that have come together in their local communities to raise awareness about forced displacement and the experiences of people seeking sanctuary and really promote welcome in their, in their local community. The other aspect of the work that we do is in our streams of sanctuary. And this is when we bring together organizations and institutions within a shared field of practice or interest and help them embed policies and practices of welcome within their setting. So, for example, we have schools of sanctuary, which I'm going to focus on today, but we also have other education settings that you might be aware of um, or might be interested in, such as further education colleges and universities. And we also have gardens and um, museums, libraries healthcare settings and most recently local authorities which is which is probably quite an interesting one for some of you but today i'm going to focus on schools of sanctuary so in brief schools of sanctuary are a growing network of over 330 schools nurseries and six forms across the uk and um, although i should probably mention given having seen some of your locations that we've yet to formally recognize a school in scotland so um, if you're interested please do reach out and these are education settings that are committed to a shared vision of welcome and belonging for people seeking sanctuary and educating everyone within the school community about forced displacement. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. And so to become a school of sanctuary, um, a school must evidence having gone through three different processes. And actually, these processes are the same for any organisation or institution that is wanting to be recognised as a place of sanctuary and receive an award from City of Sanctuary UK. And these processes are learning, embedding and sharing. But for schools of sanctuary, we also have eight minimum criteria which come within these processes. So, for example, within the learn process, we have um, we expect that everyone within the school community should learn about forced displacement and the experiences of people seeking sanctuary. We also um, ask that all school staff learn about some of the challenges that um, students seeking sanctuary might experience and how to overcome them. The embed process is all about some of these um, issues and um, embedding the, the policies and practices that Jane and Catherine have kind of touched on already so far making sure that the school can effectively meet the needs of refugee and asylum seeking students, but generally um, make sure that the school is a place of welcome and inclusion that respects everyone within that school community. The share aspect is about making sure that what the school has learned about forced displacement and this vision of welcome is extended outside the school setting. So making sure that parent and carers are aware of what it means to be a school of sanctuary and also are aware of some of the things the school have learned about forced displacement. It also involves the school perhaps reaching out to local refugee organisations to um, give acts of solidarity and support. In some cases, we've had also had schools working from what they've learned to reach out to their um, local MPs and counsellors and um, children have talked to their MP about some of the issues that they've learned and why they think that they should be more supportive of refugees and asylum seekers. But essentially, these three processes, we think, should be a really good vehicle for schools to adopt in order to develop and improve school practice um, in meeting the needs of refugee and asylum seeking students in a very holistic way. We also think that, you know, the School of Sanctuary Award helps celebrate and recognise the schools that are already doing great practice in this field. Uh, in areas that are typically overlooked or underappreciated in other forms of national assessment and evaluation. But I'm very quickly, if we have time, was wanting to focus on the learn aspect in, in particular and why learning about migration is a really important um, feature of making sure that the school is a place of welcome. Now, I'm sure you're all aware that there is a real prevalence of negative and inaccurate rhetoric from um, in the public, um, from politicians and in the media about migration and about people seeking sanctuary more, more specifically. By proactively engaging children and young people um, in learning about these things and learning about the facts and the reality behind the headlines, we can combat misinformation and ignorance and reduce bullying and hate crime in our schools. I think as well by also 
making sure that students understand the experiences of people seeking sanctuary, both during their migration and on arrival in the UK, we can really build compassion for the newest members of our communities. Uh, next slide, please. So when learning about forced displacement, it's often really helpful to start right at the beginning, looking at the why, who, where, and how. Why are people forcibly displaced? Who is being, who, who is, um, being forcibly displaced? Um, where these people are being moved from and to, and how they are treated in their new um, settlement context. I would kind of emphasize when you're looking at these things, one thing that's really important to focus on is the diversity of experiences of people seeking sanctuary and also making sure that, you know, students connect, can connect with the person um, that they're, of, the, 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 of the people who are forced to do these things. Um, often when we look at just refugees or asylum seekers, it can be quite othering. Whereas if you hear also about that person's dreams for the future, um, their relationships with their families, their hobbies, students can better connect with them and, and, and feel more compassionate towards people seeking sanctuary. Uh, next slide. Having said that, I also think it's really important that when looking at forced displacement, we look at migration more broadly. Um, and so we look at this in the global context, looking at where people are moving from and to and all the reasons that that happens. And also the historical context. Often in the media, we hear, um, you know, really sensationalized reports about the numbers of people arriving and precedented numbers and things like that. It's really important that children are conscious that migration is not something that is new. Forced displacement is not something that is new, but this is a long part of human history. And there are a couple of ways that schools have done this really successfully. One is by looking at students' personal stories of migration. And I think even in what some people would call the you know, less diverse parts of the country, 99% of student will, students will have some connection to migration. Of course, for some students, this might have been you know, moving over from Syria or coming from Eritrea or other parts of the world. And um, for other students, this might be having a grandma who moved over from Ireland or um, an uncle who moved to Australia or a sister who's currently studying at university in France. And by kind of looking at migration in this way, students can realize that migration is not something that just happens to other people, but it's something that we are all very intimately connected with and avoids that kind of othering aspect of learning about forced displacement, displacement and migration themes. Another approach is by looking at local migration histories um, so, for example, colleagues in Norfolk have done some great work looking about uh, looking at the strangers um, who were refugees who arrived in Norfolk in the 16th century, fleeing religious persecution. And in doing so, the children can better understand that um, people seeking sanctuary have long been part of our communities and are very much who we are now. And this is not a new thing. Um, next slide, please. And kind of the last element that I really wanted to touch on was once students have learned about these things, I think it's really important to give them space to put this into action. For example, if students have learned about, um, for asylum seekers not being able to work whilst they're waiting for a decision on their claim, we've had some schools who have actively got involved with campaigns, email, um, contacting their MP to say why they think that this is not a good thing and um, raising awareness amongst their families and in the community more generally. I think this is a really important thing because it obviously en enables the young generation to be critical thinkers and develops them as active citizens who are working for a better future. But also because schools are the center of our communities, they can have a really powerful reach and can raise awareness within the wider area across families and things like that. And in doing so, we can work towards a more welcoming future for um, refugees and asylum seekers and challenging some of the difficult experiences that they, they currently experience. Um, I really hope you uh, got some things from that. It was very much a whistle-stop tour. But if you have any further questions, um, I would really encourage you to go and have a look at our website. We have um, just shared, actually, in the last six months, a brand new resource pack for schools. You can also order that um, in hard copy, and it should be answer any questions you have about schools or sanctuary. We have case studies from schools. We signpost to resources. Um, we have a termly newsletter. So I really recommend you going and checking that out. But if you have any specific questions, please feel free to send me an email, which is on the screen. 
Thank you very, very much, uh, Megan. And might as well start with you because there are very many questions coming, but there's one for you, uh, Megan. Caroline would like to know how you joined the Schools of Sanctuary Network. Well, Caroline, um, I would start off by going and having a look at our website. And um, we do have a process up there. The first step that I would recommend for all schools, and, and it's one of the minimum criteria, actually, and it takes less than two minutes, so you're already well on your way, is signing the supporting organize, organizational pledge for your school. And this basically um, demonstrates your school's commitment to this shared vision of welcome and belonging. When you sign that, you'll get linked into me, and I will connect you with a local lead to support you through the journey and give you next steps. Thank you, Megan. Um, there are quite a few questions that are quite similar. So the first cluster of questions is around uh, trauma and supporting supporting learners with um, post-traumatic stress disorder, trauma, etc. So um, I'll just read this first question, which I imagine, Catherine, you might want to answer. Um, are there any services schools can access specifically for refugees struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma, given that language is often a barrier with existing school pastoral teams? So I'm, I'm, I'm basically saying, Catherine, but uh, any of you who want to say something about this, you're welcome to do so. Um, yeah, I'm happy to kick off. Um, it's a it's a really good question, and it is one that comes up again and again. And you're right that language is a real particular challenge. I think there's quite a lot of. Um, I mean, I. I won't go through them, but we could send it as a follow up um, afterwards if people are interested. But I'm kind of working from an assumption that you're probably familiar with some of the kind of broader um, generic um, school based um, and services for schools in terms of mental health. So things like kind of trauma informed schools, UK, um, UK Trauma Council that has kind of quite a lot of schools resources, um, Mind Education Hub, things like that. But none of those are language specific. Um, so one of the one of the things that has um, come up recently that has been uh, quite useful, although it can be difficult to get through one, there's a helpline called the Bola helpline. Um, it kind of came up in some of the early days of the pandemic, um, but it's a support line that delivers um, support and therapies in community languages, and that includes Pashto and Dari. Um, so we've had kind of some success getting um, young people um, support through that, but it's um, it can be difficult to get through um, at times. A couple of other things that it's worth looking at, and particularly if you're looking um, for things that support Afghan children. Um, there are some resources that Save the Children produced recently that are um, home-based psychosocial wellbeing activities for children, and they're available in Pashto and in Dari. Um, and similarly, that another, another organization called Education Above All um, has also created a really um, quite comprehensive pack of uh, resources that includes wellbeing activities for children um, designed for use by teachers in the classroom that are also available in Dari and Pashtu. Um, but uh, I wish there was like a really easy answer to that question, but I think anything that we've found so far has been imperfect, but there are a few of the things that we've been drawing on lately. Thank you. Would you like to add anything to that, um, Jane, or are you happy to move on to the next question? No, I think that was an amazing answer. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. An associated question. Anna would like to know whether there are any recognized refugee asylum trauma support courses available for teachers to gain qualifications or knowledge to support students who are suffering from trauma. Catherine, would you like to come in on that? Sure. I mean, I'm definitely not an expert in this, <laughs> but I will I will do my best. I have some colleagues who are more expert in it than I am. Um, so the places that my colleagues have been to get trained in this have been the Tavistock Centre um, in London, who do um, a range of things around therapeutic and mental health and therapeutic support programmes for the refugee community in particular. And they found that um, quite useful for the school setting. Um, the other person that I would really recommend looking at her work is at Oxford academic called Professor Mina Fazal. Um, her kind of area of expertise is, I can, I'll, after this I'll try and put her link in the chat, her area of expertise is specifically equipping edu non-clinical education practitioners to support the mental health needs of refugee and asylum seeking children. So it couldn't be kind of more spot on in terms of what is needed. Um, and she has produced various like resource kits um, and things like that that can be, that are really helpful. Um, I know she used to kind of go and do training and things like that in schools but I'm not sure that she does that um, at the moment um, 
yeah we're working at the moment actually it's a kind of slow burner project but we're working on a six-week um course in uh, equipping helping professionals equip and volunteers um support the mental health needs of refugee children in partnership with her um but it's not yet finished but i will certainly share it when it is thank you very much catherine a question a couple of questions for you jane um one very specific what's the name of the phonics program in in a graphic uh, novel format can you remind us there, there are several. It's a series, a progressive series. So if you go onto the website, I can see that it's been put into the, the chat, the Phonics Books website. You'll see that there's a series which is for older learners who are new to literacy. Um, and as I say, it's progressive. I know one of them is called Magic Belt, but that might not be the first one. You'll find it on the website. Thank you. And another question for you, Jane. Um, Angie says, Great that Nottingham UASC have bespoke provision. How do you also facilitate their social integration? Yeah, really great question. So um, we ensure that we're out and about, as I said, a lot. Um, we are now part of a wider school. So we've amalgamated with um, a Nottingham City School um, and so have access to other young people who are based on other sites of our school. Um, we feel, I mean, inclusion was, um, was my field from, from the outset, and I, I always believe very strongly that mainstream is the best place for young people. The reason that Nottingham has um, gone down this route for our older learners is specifically because of this age range, young people who have reached the very end of statutory school age and that need a really good quality provision now immediately to support them with making plans for their future. So for, certainly for our younger learners, we would always be promoting mainstream um, as, as the best place for them. It's interesting you anticipated yourself to the next question that I was going to ask you. So you kind of half answered it, but let's let's listen to it and see whether there's something you'd like to add, Jane. I've always been told that mainstream schools and asks are best for EAL learners as they are immersed into English language and make friends with English speakers who can be good role models. Do you think that schools like Nest are a better option? No, not a better option. It's a different option. As I say, don't really probably need to add very much to my previous answer. Um, the reason that we really had to um, put this provision in place was because of the this very specific age and stage of this group of young people right at the end of their secondary education um, who were really falling through the gaps and were um, very vulnerable to a whole range of risks. Thank you, Jane. Uh, I'm now going to ask Catherine to come in and tell us a little bit. There are a couple of questions about funding. So if I read them together and then. Uh, so the first question around funding would be what funds are available to support refugee students with starting school? And how does the whole thing funding, uh, the whole funding thing work, says Janie. And she says, for example, she's had Syrian refugee students that came through with some funding, but also other refugees from Iran and Sudan who have come with no funding. And an associated question is, what finding, if any, is available for Afghani refugees and how is this accessed? Yeah, thank you. That's another, it's really, really, um, yeah, really spot on questions. I think the key, the key difference is whether a, a child has come through a resettlement program or is in the asylum system. Um, so um, a, a lot of the Syrian and Afghan children um, that you might be working with, although of course only the very recently arrived Afghan children, um, have come through resettlement programs where there is a package of support um, either through the local authority or subcontracted to um, another organization like I think you did to say the Red Cross um, where there is support around those items that you mentioned and uniform and other support costs. If a child is um, in a family in the asylum system then they won't get specific support for education related uh, costs you know outside of uh, you know any potential eligibility for free school meals and things like that but um, what really what we've seen um, for those children is that the school level type of support becomes really important so um, things like uniform banks um, and I mean the 
one of the school, in fact, school that I was just at yesterday is running a uniform bank, it's running a food bank, it's running like an equipment exchange, it's uh, it, running all kinds of things precisely because there are always children who are falling through the gaps in terms of their funding entitlements. Um, but then related to that question specifically about um, Afghan young people, um, then like, par partly it's kind of linked to what I was saying about resettlement in that a lot of them are coming through resettlement programs. But the only thing that I would add to that is if there is funding that is needed for technology in particular, um, so like devices essentially, um, uh, mobile phones, tablets, um, computers, then there are a few initiatives that have been set up specifically to provide those um, for Afghan children. So partly through the government's, um, you know, so-called Operation Warm Welcome um, scheme, there, um, it, there are, I think it's something like up to 6,000 devices available for children in years three to 13, um, uh, but they have to have come through one of the most recent Afghan um, resettlement programs. Um, I can share the link for um, finding out if someone could like sign up to get that here as well. Um, there is also, um, something that's happened called the Great British Tech Appeal through Bernardo's um, where kids can get mobile phones um, and uh, a few other types of tablets and um, the mobile phones come with data and sim cards so again I can um, I can share the link for that as well but I realize that's only like one tiny jigsaw um, piece of the whole funding puzzle. Thank you and while I have you here Catherine can you repeat the name of the helpline asks Katie is it BOLA which provides yeah, diary I, mental I put it in the chat earlier Thank so you. if you scroll up you'll find the name of it plus its number um, um, and the explanation of it but yeah it was BOLA. Fantastic thank you very much. Uh, I just, look, could yes. I just add, add oh, Silvana in yeah. terms of funding one thing that's often forgotten um, is that now that now that funding for EAL learners is no longer ring fenced in school budgets, it does still exist. So as soon as a young person, a child or a young person goes onto a school role, um, when the next census comes around, that does trigger additional funding for the first five years of that child's time in school. Um, not many people know about it. It's well hidden because it goes into the big pot, um, but schools do receive additional funding in recognition of having beginners to, to English. Thank you. There are so many questions coming. It's really hard to choose. They're so all so interesting. But I'm going to go with uh, a very interesting one about siblings. Um, so Jennifer wants to know, how is the best way to approach intervention when you receive sibling groups in school? We are finding that older siblings are struggling to settle as quickly as younger. But it is this is creating tensions between siblings. Does anybody want to come in on that? Oh dear, silence. <laughs> Shall we move on to the next question then? Could you uh, just repeat the questions? Yeah, of course, of course. So uh, is the question how to how to how to help older siblings in that? Yeah, Sorry. what is the best approach actually when you receive sibling groups in the school? Mm -hmm. um, we are finding that older siblings are struggling to settle as quickly as the younger, but this is creating tensions between siblings. Yeah, that's really difficult. We actually, we actually had that a school raise that with us like about two weeks ago, um, and it was we were so I I, I can only brain I was we were brainstorming together so I can share some of the things that they um, that they came up with, but, but um, I take no credit for them myself. Um, so they they'd come up they had exactly this situation, um, and I think it was a a child in reception, a child in year three and a child in year six that they had taken um, taken in. And um, the child in year six, they were finding like particularly, um, it was particularly struggling to, to settle. Um, whereas the child in reception was a lot, it was, it happened to be finding it a lot easier. And they, um, they they set up this thing where um, they have a number of refugee children in the school where they um, it targeted some of the older refugee children and created a kind of support 
group club for the younger ones um, and they called it some, uh, something like Big Brother Big Sister or something like that and it was like it didn't happen that frequently so the intensity of it wasn't like too much but it was like a monthly lunchtime club or something like that where younger kids could come and talk to older kids who were also from a forced migration background and just ask them for advice and so even and there was no kind of bar on like you have to have settled this much or have been in the school for this number of weeks or months in order to be in the kind of older giving advice category um, and somehow that just creating that space where the older ones got that a little bit of just recognition of like ah, oh, there's younger kids that you might be able to support even if you have arrived more recently than them but like they'll look up to you in some way seem to be starting to help that um that older child although it was very much kind of like a work in progress um but yeah so that's one thing that one school that we've worked with has tried we're running out of time thank you but i just want to sneak in one more question if you don't mind um and it's a kind of uh, associated question so one is do, do you recommend play therapy art therapy music therapy and is there a specific funding for these and a similar question how do you deal with a situation when the refugee has to attend the drama, music and dance lessons if they're unfamiliar with this culture and the school forces them to attend as they need to learn British culture. Um, Jane, would you like to answer that? Sure, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I don't, yeah, I've not come across a, a culture that doesn't have a, a history of music, dance and drama in some forms. I don't think those things belong to British culture at all. Um, and as you can probably tell from, from my presentation, these are things that I feel are really, really important for a young person's well-being. Um, but that has to be dealt with very sensitively. So the, the word forced was used here. It sounds as though um, maybe the situation has not been sensitively young people may well need uh, a period to to sit back and watch and absorb um maybe um time for them to get get involved in supporting in other ways so for example with drama when we have new students who are reluctant to act out immediately we can always find other roles such as making of props and uh, posters etc so that they're still involved in the drama activity in a safer way um, but music dance and drama are all important parts of our curriculum as our as is sport um, and we feel that it gives our young people a chance to play and relax um, and, and they, they do value those, those areas of the curriculum. Thank you so much. And there are so many unanswered questions, but thank you so ever so much, Catherine, Jane and Megan, for such insightful, informative presentations and answers with full of recommendations and practical suggestions. So that brings us to the end of our webinar today. But before we finish, can I just very briefly let you know of some of other training opportunities that we have coming up? So first off, uh, two free webinars coming up, one on the on the 16th of March at four o'clock, supporting learners using EAL in vocabulary development for primary, and the following day, the 17th, um, on the secondary version of the same webinar. And we have a couple of three-hour online courses coming up as well, very relevant to what we're talking today. On the 1st of March, we have a three-hour online course called Supporting New Arrivals Who Are New to English. This is, has got a very specific focus on supporting and welcoming learners who are seeking refuge. Um, 20th of April, an introduction to EAL assessment. And on the 4th of May, uh, a course on teaching assistance and working with learners using EAL. A quick reminder that you will get an email tomorrow with a link to the video recording of this webinar. And when you leave the webinar, a post uh, course evaluation form will appear and you will get a link to the same form in the email tomorrow. We'd be really very grateful if you could spend a few moments to complete it as your views, of course, will help us shape future events. Thank you very much again for taking part in today's webinar and thanks to today's speakers, Catherine, Jane and Megan. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.